Prior to human habitation, Europe was more or less covered by forests. In the far north, boreal forest ecosystems were dominant. There was a wide band of cool temperate forest running through the centre, and this was followed by a fringe of Mediterranean forest in the south. In this short video, we shall be focused on cool temperate forest, exploring the impact of forest management on the landscape and ecology of southeast England. The prehistoric forest was composed largely of deciduous broadleaves, which grew together and formed a dense, closed canopy forest interspersed with more open areas created by natural disturbance events such as windstorms or fires and maintained by grazing herbivores. As human population grew, the forests were gradually cleared for agriculture. Today, Europe has a population of more than 800 million people. Although its mean forest cover of 46% is well above the global average of 31, the European figure incorporates wide variation. In Finland, forests cover some 86% of the total land area, while in the United Kingdom, the figure is just 12%. In southeast England, the landscape is now composed of an intimate patchwork of agricultural fields, human settlements, and remnant patches of semi-natural woodland. Today, we're going to visit three wooded areas in the southeast. These sites will allow us to explore the history of British silviculture and see for ourselves the impact of forest management on the landscape. We begin our tour at a site of special scientific interest, which provides a glimpse back into the distant past when the forests were first cleared for farming. This open wooded landscape is of particular scientific interest because the land use has not been altered for at least 500 years. Following clearance of the forest, this area was established as a deer park. Thus, in silvicultural terms, what we see here are ancient forms of agroforestry, wood pasture and pollards. Hello, uh, my name is Graham Woodgate and this is Peter Buckley and today we're going to take you on a brief tour around three sites in the southeast of England where we're going to have a look at the impact of silviculture and forest policy on the landscape. We're going to begin our tour here at Hatch Park. Peter, Hatch Park's a very special site. Will you tell us a little bit about it? Yes, it is a special site. It's actually recorded as a site of special scientific interest. And the main components here are the, the pasture, which is very old. It's not been cultivated, as you can see from the anthills around. And also the trees, which are, many of them are veteran or very old trees, some of which have been pollarded and some which have not. Uh, the trees themselves have a special interest because they have nooks and crannies in them, uh, some areas of rot, so they've got some fungi developing on them. Also, they're particularly good for insects, which specialise on dead wood, and whole nesting birds. And because it's out in the open, then the trees are also festooned with lichens, which are particularly rare in this part of Kent. Shall we have a look at some of those in a bit more detail then? Scattered trees occur over much of the park, principally species of Quercus and Carpinus. The continuity of land use over many centuries has resulted in the development of species-rich acid grassland. The park's existence is recorded in the Doomsday Survey of 1086, and this long period without cultivation has allowed for the development and maintenance of innumerable ant colonies, which give rise to an easily recognisable, but today rather rare, landform. Hatch Park is also one of just a handful of British woodlands that are still actively managed by pollarding. The principal species is Carpinus betulus, which is regularly cut every few years at about 1.5 to 2 metres above ground, producing fodder for livestock and small poles for a variety of estate uses. Unlike coppicing, where the trees are cut down at ground level, pollarding keeps the regrowth out of the way of the park's herd of fallow deer avoiding the kind of damage we can see on this chestnut coppice regrowth. Coppicing is perhaps an even older way of managing forests than pollarding, but it is also a silvicultural system that is still extensively practised in southeast England. Although markets for coppice produce declined in the second half of the 20th century, today there is something of a renaissance of coppice management as demand for biofuels grows in the race to mitigate global warming. One of the most significant areas of coppice woodland in the vicinity of Hatch Park is King's Wood, which sits on top of the low-lying hills or downs to the northeast of Ashford. 
Coppicing is perhaps the oldest form of forest management in Northern Europe and probably began by chance as early inhabitants noted the ability of broadleaf trees to regrow from cut stumps. Areas from as small as 0.25 hectares to as much as 3 or 4 hectares are cleared each year, so that over time a patchwork of different age classes develops. Coppice products depend on the species, with traditional uses such as hazel hurdles, hornbeam charcoal, chestnut fencing posts, and ash for tool handles. So Peter, we've left the Stour Valley and we've moved up onto the downs, the uh, low hills above Ashford, and we've come to uh, a significant area of the woodland, a woodland, about 600 hectares, I believe. Can you tell us a little bit about it? Well, yes, it's a very large woodland, this, this one, and it's owned by the State Forestry Service, the Forestry Commission, who tended to manage relatively large blocks of woodland in this part of England, in southeast England. They would have acquired it uh, in about 19, the 1930s, and uh, they obviously have done a certain amount of modification here. Okay. And uh, it looks as though we've got a uh, fairly um, clearly distinct silver cultural system here. What's this silver cultural system? Yeah, it's very distinct. Uh, much of it is, is this uh, pure crop of sweet chestnut you can see around us, which is uh, showing one year's growth after the last cut. But in the background you can see some of the standard trees and originally the woodland, when the Forestry Commission acquired it, would have been this type of silver culture, coppice with standards. So uh, what you're seeing now is a modification of the coppice where it's become more or less pure and not a mixed species stand. Okay, so we've got the chestnut coppice which has grown on a rotation of 20 years perhaps? Yes, more? 15 to 20 15 years. 15 to 20 years. and then. The oak trees, how long are they grown for, the standards? Well, they would be grown for multiples of the coppice age, possibly four or five times the, the age, and they would be also be an uneven age population, so that there would be some which would be getting on for 100 years and some which had just been cut and developing. So if we wanted to compare this to some of our high forest silvicultural systems, the closest in terms of high forest silvicultural system is a clear fell system, is that? Uh, yes, I, I think that's fair, the, particularly with the coppice. The coppice is a kind of clear fell system, but on a much shorter rotation. Okay. The slow decline of coppicing and the growing influence of the Forestry Commission saw the expansion of plantation forestry in 20th century Britain. Low yielding, semi-natural woodlands were cleared and planted with fast growing exotic conifers. Rather than just 4 to 6 metres cubed per hectare per year, the conifers could produce as much as 30. Furthermore, in contrast to the 120-year rotation needed to grow a useful crop of native oak, the conifers would reach maximum mean annual increment and produce valuable timber in as little as 50 years. Despite the rapid growth of exotic timber species, concerns over declining biodiversity saw the emphasis in British forest policy shift back to native broadleaves in the 1970s and 80s. For some species, the coppice revival has come too late, however. Sweet chestnut has recently come under attack from a virulent species of water mould from the genus Phytophthora, the plant destroyer. As chestnut is an exotic species, the British population has rather limited genetic diversity, which may mean that coppice sweet chestnut woodland, such as that at King's Wood, soon becomes a thing of the past. The final woodland that we are going to visit is a more recent plantation an area of woodland that has been established for the express purpose of timber production on a piece of land that had been used for agriculture prior to the establishment of trees. The long plantation sits below Kingswood in the Stour Valley. It was established in the 1920s on land belonging to the University of London's Wye College. From the early 1980s until the end of the millennium, Peter Buckley was responsible for the management of the plantation. So let's hear what Peter has to say about it. So Peter, we're here in the Long Plantation and a particularly impressive stand of beech mm. which uh, you've been involved with over the years as forest manager. That's right, this is part of the Wye College estate uh, and there was only a small area of woodland on this site. These trees are probably 90 years old and were planted after the First World War when a lot of planting was done because in the First World War a lot of timber was harvested for the war effort and about a third of it was lost so a lot of planting done at that time. We think these trees are not native to the UK although they're beech which obviously grows well in Britain. This may have come from the continent and a lot of seed was collected from continental seed stands that showed particularly good management 
So and these are probably from the Ardennes um, area of, of Belgium originally. Now, particularly impressive in terms of timber trees, but is it timber that you're going to be using these for immediately? or? Well, they have other value. I mean, normally you would be felling trees around this age for the timber, as you say, but these trees have such good form, that is, they're nice round circular trees um, and very, very straight, uh, very little branching, very fine branched, and so they qualify as uh, worthy of a, a seed stand. And under EU regulations, they can be certified by the Forestry Commission particularly for their value and the seed used commercially to establish other stands and to restock other forestry areas. And so these have been registered as a seed stand? Yes, we managed to get these done about um, 15 years ago. And it was probably just on the margin in that normally with a seed stand you want lots and lots of trees to get the most amount of genetic variation that you can capture. This was a small stand, about half a, half a hectare, but enough trees, probably 100 plus trees here, to give you that variation. These final scenes give you some idea of the height of the beech trees in the plantation, around 30 metres, but they don't illustrate the quality of the timber very well. Neither of the trees shown is particularly cylindrical, straight or finely branched. Be that as it may, the standard as a whole is of very good quality and demonstrates what can be achieved through the careful selection of parent genetic materials. So. We hope you found this brief excursion into the history of silviculture and forest policy interesting and a useful introduction to the study of sustainable forest management. What should be clear is that forestry is a long-term business in which the decisions that we make today have implications well into the future.